On behalf of Lieutenant Governor Billy Montgomery, I want to recognize Ronda Remy's Doge as an official Louisiana tradition bearer and I express gratitude for her dedication to the Steza and Chanta Apache traditional folkways, including food ways, gardening, hand sewing, quilting, healing, midwifery, and the list can go on. Um, we want to thank you for your outstanding contributions, your steadfastness, your persistence, your devotion, your faith in and commitment to traditional Louisiana culture. This is the kind of thing that keeps losing the tradition alive, the people. So thank you. So I'm also happy to announce that Rhonda, and this has been frankly too long to coming, uh, Rhonda will be recognized as an official uh, member of the Louisiana Folk Center Hall of Master the uh, Hall of Master Folk Artists at the Nightmare of Youth Folk Festival coming up uh, on July 22nd of next year. So, of course, please join us at the festival. We're ready for the best show in Louisiana. Um, you'll love it. And Rhonda, we're done with the scripted part. Now it's time to move to the unscripted part of our program. Rhonda, thank you so much for being here today. You will. <laughs> you got questions? I do. Uh, I asked one ahead of time. I said, hey, what questions should I ask you? He said, oh, just ask me anything. So I'm going to start by asking you about a couple things that Pete told me to ask you about. You know, uh, you can never get in trouble while Pete Gregor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he told me to ask you about Google farming. Oh, uh, okay. So, You're on. Okay. Mule farming. Okay, we, we're going to step back a moment. My brother helped my father until he was 11, and he got killed in a hunting accident. So my older sisters, they were teenagers, and they didn't want to work outside the house. So I was eight, and I had to start helping Dad work on the farm. So my dad's plow was new up until uh, probably 1998-99 and then he stopped he started having strokes but until i was in high school i helped him on the farm i made him new farming like he called it i mean he would get up early in the morning before school started and he would hook the mules up how early was that how early the daylight <laughs> it would be daylight so he would hook the mules up and i would have to follow him along and pick up any rocks, any roots, or anything. They're like, he had all the plows, and he had one he called the busting plow, so that was a big plow. And it actually broke up the hard ground, and dug up everything that was there that didn't need to be there, and I would have to move it out of the way. But as the years went by, you know, I kind of helped him out, getting the mule together, feeding the mule, and taking care of the plows, and when all the crops came up, now it was pretty much on him because he had the sweeps. He would go through the uh, through the rows, in between the rows when everything was up, and he would use the sweeps. As the plants started coming up, these sweeps were almost like in a triangle shape, and he had every size. And he would start with the smallest, clean in the middle of the rows. And then as the plant, the crops got larger and larger, he would move up to the bigger sweep so we could get everything out of the middle of the rows. And then we only had to clean what was around the little plants. And my daddy didn't go small. When we had 20 acres on end, we had some set aside for the farm animals. But when I was growing up, they had, uh, we didn't have to cave to put your animals in a pen, so it was free range. So everything was out in the mornings, but it would come in in the evening. So we set aside part of the property for that. And then he would plow probably four to five acres that we would have to take care of. And my older sisters did have to come from the house and hoe and, and take care of the plants and, and see the field. So one year, uh, my older sisters, like I said, they didn't like working in the field. So they were going to be real cute. They just spread the seed everywhere. They didn't put it in the rows. Well, every bit of the stuff came up. <laughs> and 
that old man was mad. So what he did was, he was like, baby, you can go to the house. You bigger girls, you get in them pea vines and you pick everyone in peas. And I'm, if you've ever picked peas, you know those pea vines will tear your legs up, your feet, your hands, and everything, because they scratch you up. They had to pick every one of those peas. But we farmed, I mean, table to, I mean, farm to table today is not a new thing for me because the table to farm thing was, was just a natural way of life for us. Uh, they grew everything, corn, peas, turnip greens, peppers, all kinds of peppers, squash, uh, okra. I mean, and we had our cows that we killed. We had our hogs that we killed. We had chickens. We had turkeys. We had guineas. So there was nothing that we didn't raise except the fish. And we would fish the bayous for that because we live right there on Bayou C. And um, the bayou ran right behind our house, so we'd just go back there and do the fish. But my dad said he plowed that new until he started having strokes when he was in his mid-80s. And he started when he was nine years old. And Mama, Mama and my grandma and them, they told him that he had use of me to help him after Pat got killed until I got hurt helping him. You know, and when I got hurt, <laughs> my mama, she was, she was a real matriarch of the household. She said, when you hurt my girl, she said, I'm going to take the ball back to you, John. So, I mean, and it did. It happened. I was about 11, and we were building a barbed wire fence. Mm -hmm. And what he would do, he would use the come-alongs to stretch the barbed wire, and he would go post to post, or every three posts, and he would stretch it. And then I would nail it. Well, he decided this is taking too long. We're going to do it my way. So he went way down the line and he was stretching that barbed wire with those come alongs and it came loose and I could hear it. That wire was just like a whip or like a whiz in the air. And he hollered for me to cover my face and that barbed wire wrapped me up on my hips and my back. I got scars where he had to cut the barbed wire up. And so then. They took me away from him, and they told him he had to get some little man to help him. <laughs> so, and it was funny, because I was probably about 11 or 12, and my grandma, she chewed him out. So that's when I started learning how to do all this embroidery and quilting and stuff. She said, that child, that girl is too old. Be out there in the fields. It's time for her to come to the porch and learn real stuff that women do. So they taught us to embroidery, they taught us to fringe, they taught us to do quilting, and she took her ideas when she embroidered, just like I had this little sunflower. My grandma was a herbist. In her younger days, she was midwife, and she, she probably delivered babies around Zawali up until the hospital or when Dr. Murdoch started coming into the area. And that's when she quit. So that had to be like the 1950s. And so she used to say, I know who every one of the babies belong to. <laughs> she was funny. She said, I know who all them babies belong to. But I, 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 that would seem obvious. Yeah. What did you really mean that? Well. <laughs> well <laughs> see, well, no, no, it's not, it's 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 not like that. Because <laughs> My dad grew up on what they call Bayou C. It was a little south of Zwala. My mother grew up uh, like at Noble and Ebar. So they had, everybody was related in some form or fashion. And so the women like my grandma, she would keep up with, you know, whoever can and you know, people would go to her and you'd be like, no, you can't marry him, you're too close kin. So, it was a thing like that. That's what she said. Okay. She knew who all the babies belonged to, so she would let people know who they could marry. And that went on until like the 1950s, 1960s. And uh, because, I mean, eventually, you know, after World War II, of course, people started marrying out of the community. And, you know, because the guys went off to war. And, a lot of them, like my uncle Luke, 
he met his wife through World War II. He was in the Air Force. And so Aunt Gracie was in the Air Force. And so when he came back home, he had his wife. You know, but then Uncle Jeff, he married my mama's first cousin. And my daddy, of course, you know, he married my mom. And of course, my, uh, I'm trying to think. Daddy's first cousin, my Uncle Leo, married my mama's sister. So that's why I'm saying the women kept up with who all the kids belonged to and who everybody was marrying so that they wouldn't have first cousin marriages too much or a lot of second cousin marriages in the community. Uh, and that's just the way it was back then. But uh, she did her little uh, delivering babies and she took care of a lot of children. She uh, did medicines from her herbs. She grew all her herbs in her yard. She had every kind of herb, every kind of flower that you could imagine. And like I said, when she would sit on her porch to do her embroidery and her stitches, you know, she could look out, she'd see the flowers, and she would just put them in her. But I got these on what we call little pockets. You know, it was the stitch that she used to go on her aprons. Because when back in the day, you got flour on cloth sacks. So those cloth sacks, they would use those to make their aprons, or if they wouldn't real big, they'd make the smaller aprons and they would put embroidery on it. Or they'd use the materials to quilt with. So her squares, this little thing right here, I made them just to go on the tabletop, but the squares were the quilts that they would make. You know, they would, a lot of times they would use the flour sacks that they would get from the store. And as I was saying earlier about growing things, the only thing that we ate everything that we raised on the farm. So my mother's cousin owned what we call Polly Hart's grocery store in Zawali. And that's where you know all of our relatives we would shop. But very rarely that we went on the north side of the track and uh, shopped at Vickers and Leftwitz and places like that. We would shop at Polly Bar. So she, she, she would call up there. And delivering groceries is not a new thing either. My mother's cousin, Mr. Jake Rivers, worked for Mr. Paul Ebar. And if my dad had to work a double shift at the meal, or, or you know, he was busy, and she didn't have a vehicle because we were a one-car family to go into town to get her stuff, she would call Miss Pauline and she would give her a list. Pauline would get her stuff together and Jake would deliver it. Jake delivered groceries out to the local community, to people you know that didn't have vehicles or you know that who were sick or something. But that was one of the things that they did. And I don't know, do y'all remember right now? People out here are probably my age remember those old red skin wings at the grocery stores you could buy from the market. Bologna. A loaf of bread, cheddar cheese, because my grandma made white cheese. We didn't have the yellow cheddar cheese. But when we would call Polly Bars and Mama would say, send in girls some red skin wings or some bologna or cheddar cheese, that was a treat for us. That's something that we didn't have to kill in the process to eat. So it was something different, you know, and we wanted, we wanted that different being kids. So they would send it to us, you know, she would get it for us, and we thought that was something. Of course, after we got it, we had all that red food filling in our mouth, you know, we'd throw the rest of the way to the dog. <laughs> but just things like that, I can sit and remember that we, what we would do, you know, like our gardening. When we got through in our garden, my dad's oldest brother, well, his name was Floyd Falcon, he had 10 children, so his children, and all of us other kids, we would go down to his farm and we would pick up all, pick all the produce that he had down there. Or when they were killing hogs or killing beef, we would go help them. And Aunt Chuka, that was his wife. She would, her name was Aunt Chuka. And she would, she always wanted skin from the cows because she, they, excuse me, they used the cow hides to cut the chairs. So the ones that she would pick out, to, for her chairs, we would either have to go on top of the barn and tack them, tack them down the flesh up so the birds could pick most of the flesh off, 
or even, you know, if she wanted the hair off of the cowhide, we would have, she would have us some wood ash, she would have to rub it into the hair, and we'd tack that on the side of the barn, and then, you know, she would uh, flesh the outside of it. But that, they leave the flesh on, and as soon as, before it got real dry, is when they put it on the chairs. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. when the flesh was dry then, it would get real tight, and it would adhese the wood on the chairs. But I can just remember the I You know, those, those old, old barns that had spaces with logs. And we'd climb up, climb up through the spaces, you got little monkeys going up there with the cow high to tack it down to the roof. But it's just things like that. And then if we had to procure a high, a letter, she showed us how to do that. Because my grandpa would make it. My grandpa was, he had polio. And when he was young, a uh, young child, and he rode his horse and everything until he started getting older. And he you know, put riding his horse, and he got to where he was staying home. And he set up under his magnolia tree every day. So when we hand those hides out, he would cut it in the strips. And he would sit there under his magnolia tree by the fence, and he would tie it off to the fence post, and he would make uh, whips for day. And uh, somebody asked me one time, I said, well, he used four braid to do the whips. I, I can't do that. So I don't know how to make a whip, but I can three braid. If I need to. But, you know, growing up on the farm was totally, totally different than growing up in town. And my cousin over here, she would, she could tell you about that because she grew up downtown Zawali and she didn't, she didn't have any of these experiences that we did on the farm. And, you know, daddy would plow so many acres of corn, of yellow bean corn, because that was the fodder for the animals. That was the feed, like for the cows and the hogs and everything. And sometimes the chickens, we would grind and feed it for them. And then he grew a couple of acres of white uh, shoot egg corn for mama to make tamales. She always wanted white corn. And it was, and the other reason why he did that, because the shoot egg corn was easier to, uh, you know, get off the cob. And we spent many days taking that corn off the cobs because she made hot tamales. And that is the way that I learned to make hot tamales with her and my grandma and them. Now all the hard work cleaning up and cooking the corn, the men did that. Daddy and them would pile up hard wood and they would burn it down. It would be him and all my uncles and my great uncles sitting around out there in, in the evenings, like Mama said, drinking their beer. And <laughs> And they would wait until it all burned down to the white ash. And then they would collect the ash and they would put it in a big cast iron pot so it would make it light. And they, they used the old method that you call nixtamalization to make hominy. So that's why a lot of our, like my relatives in Zawali that still do this, that's why their corn masa takes, tastes so much different than if you just buy the bag on the surf. You just go buy a hominy and grind it. That nixtamalization process, it turns that hard corn into soft hominy. And so once they got all the, the live on them, then mom and them would strain it until it was clear. And then they would cook their corn out in a big pot. And sometimes it would be 40 to 80 gallons of corn. And then we would have to wash it wash it and wash it to get there's a little husk on that corn kernel that would fluff off but some of them would stay with the little uh the husk on there and we would have to wash it to get it off so that they could then grind it to make uh masa. i heard it about seven times mm -hmm. yeah and, you know, well it depends you know now if you use the yellow if she didn't have any shoe cake corn she would use the yellow green corn and it, it's harder to get the husk off the yellow green corn than it was the little white shoe cake corn. It was, it was a softer little husk. But um, that was the first process of making the moms. And before they got this, they had the cannon center downtown. The 4-H department at Wally High School 
they got with the, uh, what was it? I'm trying to think. Anyway, they built this cannon center downtown because the 4-H boys would go over there and they learned to cut meat and everything from the big saws. But then when they did that, they had large coolers and mom and them could take their, when I was telling y'all that it was a lot of hominy they made, you, their three gallon or big old pans like this, about this deep, actually it would be tubs of corn and they could take it up there and cool it down and then sometimes Mama and Momo and uh, little Momo and Susie, sometimes they would uh, leave it there and let the 4-H boys run on the farm. But nine out of 10 times, they didn't want to wait on those boys to do it for them because they wanted to make tamales. So we were left with that task. And I mean, we just had hand grinders. I, uh, Mama had one, my grandma had one, and uh, both my grandmas had one. And we would stand there for hours grinding corn and to make the dough. And actually, you know, it went from masa, from maize to masa. Mm -hmm. That's what they call it, from the corn to the dough. And that's what masa means, the dough. And uh, that, they had not only made tamales from that dough, they would make tortillas, corn tortillas. They would mix a little bit of white flour with it. They would make a, a little pie, a pie crust, and they would put spicy meat and potatoes in there and fry it. So we would have that. Sometimes they'd make it into a little ball, and they would put spicy meat and um, fresh meat. When I say fresh meat, it was like from the hog head, around from the rump of the hog, fresh, fresh. Not going to the market and frozen and then bring it home. And uh, so they would make, uh, mix all their peppers and seasonings with it. And, and smash potatoes and mix up with it and put it in that little, uh, sometimes, when I moved to Natchitoches and people were talking about meat pies, and I was like, oh, good. They wouldn't like the meat pies that my mom and my grandma would make right? because they mix potatoes and stuff mm -hmm. in with and, uh, spicy meat. But, it's almost like a Northeastern pasty. Something, but okay. you know, it, my, my grandma and mama was the same way. They parched everything. Yeah. All their garlic, onions, tomatoes, if they were going to cook a stew. And I guess, you know, I should start doing that too because it gives it a different taste. All the peppers, they were parching. And when I say parching, my grandparents, my daddy was raised in a little house where there was no electricity. So when he came back from World War II, he was the old, my mom and my papa, that was their oldest son. So he ran electricity to their house. And eventually, when the city water came out far enough, he ran lines and put uh, water to their house so mom wouldn't have to go to the well. And he bought her a brand new gas stove. He ran gas to the house. But she had this little cast iron wood stove she would never give it up. And I mean, Daddy and him would smoke me in the uh, smokehouse, beat, whatever, and bring it in there. I would go get it, bring it in there to her. She would take that slab of meat and put it on a kamal and stick it in that little wood stove on those ashes and just let it dry until she could just hit it with a mallet or something and it would crumble up. And then she would make stews with it. She would sometimes use it to make hot tamales because pork tamales were the only kind that my grandma made. She made it, excuse me, vegetable tamales, all kinds of tamales. sweet tamales. You know, they, they grew a lot of sweet potatoes and a lot of potatoes. So she used it, she would mix it with her masa, and she would make sweet, uh, sweet tamales also for us. So it's a lot you can do with corn and masa. masa. But, uh, as I was saying earlier about me, I was 11 or 12, and it was so funny because we'd be sitting on the porch. I learned to sew on a trail machine. A trail machine has no electricity. So you sit there all day and pump this little sewing machine, and you sew Lorraine, if you remember. And so I would be, I'd be sitting on the porch, and Mama would be up there, my Aunt Dale, and some of my great aunts would be sitting on the porch, and we'd all be there. And I would be so, and Daddy would come by, you know, to get him a cup of coffee or something. He said, yeah, y'all took my help away from it. It wasn't because she got 
her is because you old ladies can't see no more. And y'all got her working to, to, to learn how to do all this stuff. Because my sisters, they, care, they didn't care anything for it. And by the time I was 13, my sister Rebecca was already married. And then when I turned... How old was she? How old was she? How old was she? Oh, uh, she was 19. And then by the time I was 14, my sister Mary was married, and then I was the next in line, and Shawnee was the baby. But, so, I got thrust into everything with the old ladies, you know, they, they taught me everything. And I didn't mind, I didn't mind being there. My grandfather died in 1969, and I would come home every evening and do what I needed to do around the house, but then I went to stay with my grandma. So basically, I lived with my grandma from 1969 until I graduated. And when I graduated, and she went to live with my uncle in Texas because, you know, I came from Northwestern. And then in 73, I got married, so there was nobody really there to help her out anymore. So she, she went to live with my uncle in Texas. But that was their thing, cooking, crocheting, making quilts, making shawls. And I mean, they made all their little, I call them doilies for their tables and their dressers, and they crocheted little mats to go on all their furniture. My grandma, I, I used to pick at her and be like, Mama, why you got all these darn cats around this place? I, I, and I got a cat today, but I tell her, I can't stand all these cats. And she said, my cats don't bother anybody, and they didn't, she had them trained. They were mousers. They lived outside, and they could come through, and they would stroll. And if she was in there doing something and she saw one and thought it was going to get up on her sofa, she would make a little hissing sound and they'd run on out the back door. But uh, she had all these cats. I couldn't stand in cats. <laughs> so, got another question for me? This is officially the easiest interview I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like I asked one question and just think it gets turned on. And <laughs> That's it. Get it run. Roman Catholic, so most of all, oh, we're, God, <laughs> we're Roman Catholic, I mean devout Catholic, you know, and, and we, all of our holidays and all our food stuff centered around a lot of times, you know, with our religion, because springtime would come, and there was Ash Wednesday, Easter holidays would kick in, Ash Wednesday, so you had 40 days where you would have to give up something for Lynn, and Eric, you know, and then couldn't eat meat on Fridays, so you just ate fish. And then after that, you know, all the holidays, like in the fall of the year, then would come. You know, it would be All Souls Day, All Saints Day, and that's coming up, All Souls Day, Halloween, All Saints Day, November the 1st, so you couldn't eat meat, and you had to go to church, you know, and you ate something special. And then Christmas time would come around. So at Christmas time, now we always had, we didn't eat most all day long on Christmas Eve. We fasted. Because we went to midnight mass. And then when a true midnight mass. And when we got back from midnight mass, then everybody would eat and go to bed. You know, and then on the day of Christmas Day. But she would cook tamales for us, you know. And, a lot of times we would have a turkey, but the turkeys were just my grandma's pretty things in the yard. You know, she hope I would kill one if it wasn't a real fat hen around and she wanted to cook something. But we had hen, we had pork roast, we had all the trimmings to go with all our food, and uh, fruit cakes, just everything, you know, that you could imagine. It would be there for Christmas. My mother and them, they, I milked cows. We had three milk cows. That was one of my duties. And I would bring the milk to the house. And then my sisters would strain the milk. And they would put it in these huge glass gallon jugs and put it in the refrigerator. And so then the cream would come separate. And then what would we would do, they would take that cream off the top of the milk. And so then you had creamer that you could use to making the whipping cream, using uh, baking cakes, and those ladies over there made some of the best cakes. 
Like I said, when we were Roman Catholic, we had a church bazaar once a year. So during that time, you, they had to make enough money at their bazaar to pay the insurance for the church, St. Joseph's Church, and the school grounds and everything. So they would make some of the most beautiful cakes out of the fresh buttermilk, the fresh butter, and you know, they would set by their flour, they would use even um, like powdered sugars and stuff, but in chocolate, they would make some beautiful cakes. Those things would auction off at our church bazaar. Monsignor knew how to put on the bazaar because he waited until it was election time. And all these politicians were there, and all the people running for sheriff and everything. And we would take these cakes up on stage as girls, and some of them would go for five hundred to a thousand dollars a piece, just a little three-layer cake. Some of them would be sheep cakes, but you know they would pay the price for these cakes. But they were some of the best cakes you could ever eat. And my mama made a coconut cake at Christmas time and we couldn't that's what I was saying, you know, we couldn't eat till after midnight. And it was Jesus' cake because it had white icing, you know, it had the white coconut and she would put some little green and red decorations on it. It's a visual Jesus loves coconut. That's it. Um, <laughs> Jesus loves coconut. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think of folklore and they think of it being this kind of the spice of life, you know, here and there. Not often the center. Folk life is when it seems to me that it's just so inundated that it's just part of everything that you're doing. And that seems to me like what you're describing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was intrinsic. You, you take, if you take the folk life out of your daily life, what was left? I mean, not, not a lot in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there would be all your food gone. Yeah. And unfortunately, once I got up into my mid to late 20s, I went to work. And I had Marsha and Derek, so you know I can cook and do like I can now that I'm retired. You know, like I was telling somebody the other day, Darren makes the benefits because he's still around. You know, he gets he gets all the foods cooked with the parched peppers and the parched garlic and the parched onion, and, and he he gets he, he knows about all the sauces. And I had some peaches that were getting real ripe in the refrigerator, and I cooked them down the other day. And somebody asked me, well, you didn't use any pectin? I said, no, we never used pectin, you know, the, the powder stuff or sure gel when we were growing up. My grandma and them, I mean, that's another thing. They had every kind of fruit tree you can imagine. Apples, pears, crab apples, cranberries, and they, they didn't do cranberries. They, but we would go out and pick blackberries and dewberries. So, your peaches and apples and stuff that comes late, they have a higher pectin in those fruits than like, you know, your, your blackberries or your strawberries. So when I was doing the peaches the other day, the peaches I just put in citrus fruits do have a higher level of pectin. I just put some lemon juice mm -hmm. into my peaches and I cooked them down with sugar. And of course, you know, I don't have a thermometer that I put in there, and, you know, that you register the heat. I don't use no timers. I put a saucer in the refrigerator and when I pull it out and I get ready to start testing my fruit, it's ice cold, and I put a little bit of it on the plate and run my finger around it to see, you know, if it, like Momo said, if it don't swim, it's good. You can jar it. And then you have to cook it. And, you know, you put it in the jars and then you put it in a steam bath for at least 20 to 30 minutes. In my sauces, you know, I, I make salsa and I'm cooking it on my fingers. So. You know, I have a, a ground beef myself with a hand grinder. It's not that hard, but it's dull. I, I hear about you grinding all that corn with your sisters. What did you do during that time? Did you see? Did you have any, any jokes? We argued. We argued. We argued about who was going to be the next thing. I was you know, you wore my blouse. You know, you weren't supposed to wear that blouse. You better clean it. <laughs> you weren't allowed to do that. Or, you know, you took my quilt off my side of the bed because. <laughs> so, in other words, you were a lot like my daughter's. Yes. Yes. That's what I was telling your wife. I said, she said, they're sweet. 
week and I said, you know, argue. I said, we argued all the time. Yeah, Especially yeah. when, you know, it was Rebecca and Arrows that argued about clothes. And, you know, and then when I kind of got, started getting older and I could wear some of their clothes, you know, that they would, I'm not in charge of laundry. I'm having to do gigs. Y'all do that laundry, <laughs> you know. And when we were growing up, we, like I said, until night after Toledo Bend Reservoir, they flooded the reservoir. You know, a lot of amenities like running water and stuff was not didn't come out to our place. So we had a well when we got our water from. But you know, we had electricity and everything, but you had to still draw the water to put in the washing machine mm -hmm. to wash the clothes. So I'd lot rather go in out there and feed my pigs and come back to the house and sit down and put my feet up. And them girls be out there doing laundry because we had we had uh, a big old machine had four legs and had a ringer on it. Oh, right. yeah. yeah, you know, and, and they would put the clothes through there. And, and my my sister Mary, they were arguing one day. Actually, my sister Mary got her arm caught in the ringer and she broke her arm. And then guess what? I had to help with the laundry and feed the pigs. <laughs> So I was so mad. Yeah, I'm thinking about the kind of people you grew up to be. Because, I mean, you know, you, you have this memory of, you know, you're going to school, but you're also, at these ages, you're, you're straight from barbed wire, and you're helping with the food of the fuel plowing, and you're, you're doing the hand washing, and you're doing all that embroidery, and you're doing all the food. I ask one of my kids, they're like 13, 14, 15, I say, hey, could you use, I'll say, the electric vacuum cleaner? I just, you know, I, I don't point out how easy this is. Could you vacuum the living room? Oh, God. It's like I asked them for their soul. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you feel people you know, just, you know, cleaning you know, and handling the hogs. Yeah. See, we had hardwood floors, something like this size of wood, it's hardwood. And so we had to clean those floors about every two or three days because I mean, people would come in. And we were a sociable family. And my grandpa, especially after he uh, he quit leaving the house and he was crippled as he got older, you know, like I said, he sat out under the magnolia tree every day. And that was another thing, ladies. I don't know about some of my cousins back there. Joe may contest this about some of the older women, but my grandpa would get up at daylight and go outside. Somebody came up to that house and said, go on in there, Susan's house. Susan's doing Susan things. You know, they didn't consider that the house, their part of the day. It was outside and it did not matter if he was crippled and he couldn't go do a regular job or work in the field. He sat outside all day long under his magnolia tree. Now don't get me wrong, when he wanted something and you know he whistled or he tapped, he was sitting on the porch and he tapped that porch, some of us or even my grandma would go out there and see what he needed and bring it to him, but it was a cup of coffee, water, or something to eat, something to snack. He got it. You know, his cigars, he smoked cigars. Or he'd smoke his pipe. If we had to clean up around where he was sitting, we took care of him right there where he sat. But he didn't go in the house because that was Mom's house. And my, you know, and come to think about it, my daddy was the same way. My daddy never went in the house just to clean up and go to bed. And that was it because they worked outside all day. He would come from the mill. He worked at the schools until I went to high school in 1969. So he retired and he went back into the sawmills. So when, if he wasn't working at that sawmill, he was either building fences, working in the garden, or just doing outside, something outside of the mall. But, but you know, they never stayed in the house. And that was just the thing because the women took care of the house, they took care of the business, they took care of the kids. They ruled the house, and it was not for the men folk. And, um, when, like I was telling y'all earlier, Daddy and me were there burning that wood down to get ash to make lye to cook the corn. Us girls didn't go out there where they were sitting because that was their men time. And Mama would tell us, "Do not go out there because they're drinking, they're they're having their time, and 
there's no place for y'all. Y'all got plenty to do. You don't need to be over there. So that's the way it was. And don't get me wrong, my daddy, when my mother died when she was 49 years old. So she was she stayed sick a lot, and it was all of us kids. And I mean, we had to go to school. And he took he cooked. He helped us wash clothes. He did chores around the house. So, I mean, it wasn't that they did, they respected the household as being the women's place, being the woman's place. They would work, they'd bring money home, give it to mama. When my mama died at 49, my daddy didn't even want to pay his bills. I had to go teach him everything, you know, how to go to the bank, put the money in the bank, pay your bills, that, you know, you got you owe this, this, and this. And so, and I was already married by that time. She died in 1981, but uh, she loved to cook, she loved to sew, she loved working out in her garden. She was like my, my little mom's. You know, we, I have one grandma we called my mom, and then we had little Susie, my, my supposed over mom. And so they, you know, they pretty much ruled the roost wherever they were. I mean, all the women are like that. You know, Lorraine has that. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary over there, cousin Mary. <laughs> so uh, that that's just the way it was in our family. You know, the men, the men played their part, and the women did their job. So now here's the question: You told us a lot about yesterday. Mm -hmm. How's all that standing now? All is standing now. I'm retired, so I got my husband in the shop. But right now. That's my extra, extra to keep you from being bored. I've been trying to work with the tribal youth, the child got back to tribal youth. So the rising sun. Yeah, the rising sun. Well, actually, the inner tribal kids. Anybody can come. The Nathan's children, the uh, you know, the, the DeRitter group, uh, Four Winds, anybody that wants to come, our youth. We're trying to teach the kids how to make them gay because this stuff is expensive. I mean, bead work, shawls, skirts, ribbon skirts, everything. To get a full regalia, I know for a boy, it depends on what style of dance that they want to do. Jake, what did you give for little Jake's last regalia? Uh, it, was cheap, it was the cheapest one I could afford, you know, at the time it was about six feet. Six hundred. And that's just the sewing part of it. Yes. That's not, you know, he, he got away from the traditional, I think he's going to grass dance. Fancy. Fancy dance. Oh, okay. Well, then he's going to have to have all the bustles, you know. So, we're trying to teach the youth how to get interested enough to make their own regalia. You know, like, I can do the shawls. I can put the fringe on the shawls. And the girls, or a lot of them are going down to the ribbon. You got a full shawl here that I hadn't finished because I ran out of thread. And the order. that one is complete. This one is complete up to the point where if somebody wants it, they can tell me if they want embroidery on it, if they want uh, applique on the blue, you know, to make it look fancier. It's a half shawl and it's got ribbon on it instead of the fringe. And the girls, you know, I was telling you earlier, about Miss Malmé, you know, her, it's five generations of them, and they've been making their brigade, all those kids. And they actually, you know, don't mind helping other children. Now, I'm not that up on the boys' stuff. I probably could make a fan or make chokers or something like that to go with their brigade, but, you know, I, I don't, I like to sew, and I don't mind teaching the kids how to sew. So you're helping these kids stay traditional? Yes, we're helping them stay traditional. Is that hard? Yes. You know, we you have to coordinate with everybody because you know there's football season, there's baseball season, and, and, and different things that they want to do. But you know, we put it out there, the information. If they want to come to the meetings, they come to the meetings. And I think they had a pretty good turnout yesterday at Tamale Festival. And, uh, so there are some successes you're seeing. Yes, and uh, we got what we call our Home Into Society. Mm -hmm. 
which is a cultural group, members of the tribe, and um, so a whole many people who you know this is helping to keep the kids together, trying to enter tribe. Yeah, oh, into that whole many people, y'all come. Whole many people, chop toppings, y'all come. And it's no story. Before the Toledo Bend, Toledo Bend was formed, you, know, you had the West and East Bank of the Sabine River. So we had relatives that lived on the West Bank and relatives that was on the East Bank of the river. So the old men would go when they wanted their people to come to the riverbed and they'd holler, whole Mindy, and that meant y'all come. And so, you know, y'all come to visit. That's where we got that term from, whole Mindy. So you were, you know, retired. Uh-huh, you're talking, well, I work for my husband. <laughs> I do his paperwork, his bookwork, his okay. taxes. <laughs> but it seems that you're still involved in culture. Yeah, I, I, I am involved in culture. And I like teaching the kids. You know, if they want to learn, we teach them. Uh, Native American Student Organization, we think we're going to do bead work on the big thing yes. at 1 o'clock at Northwestern. So, you know, intertropical kids are all invited to that if they want to come. I'm hoping my mother will do That's fine. They loved it the first time. That black bag down there, I did the beat work on the bottom. That's what I was telling you earlier. I've been working on that thing for years. So if I was sitting out, I work for parks. And if I was sitting out and visitors would come and they would ask me what I was doing, I'd let them put beads on my bag. So it's thousands of people's beading on that black bag. <laughs> So that's a remembrance for me. I use a loom and I do little caps, the little beige cap I did on the loom. The little red and green one, if you want to come up here and touch, you can tell that's my handy hand work, but it, it's kind of loose. It's not as good as the loom one. But uh, I like crocheting. I have lots of remnants of yarn. So my daughter was asking me today what I was putting together. I have a piece about this big and about this wide. I said it's going to be different colors, but I'm making them, trying to make a sweater from a dog. <laughs> it's a big dog. <laughs> she weighs about 105 pounds. So all the remnants of my yarns, I'm uh, trying to make me a little sweater, a little blanket thing for my dog. But uh, those little caps are real popular. My grandson actually retired. Uh, Ted, he's a nurse. He worked at the Shriners for a year and a half. So one year, I did little caps for all the little kids at Shriners. He gave me a number, and he came, and your mom had him a sack full of caps that he took back to the Shriners. So everybody had a little neat cap. And my grandma and them used to sit around and crochet. That's, that's a lot that they did, too. And they uh, make their little dollies, make their little shawls. Make, being Catholic up until the 70s, when we went to Mass, we wore a cup on our head, you know. So they would make their little lace doily things to go on the head to go to Mass. I got a theory, and I want to run by it. We're going to buy it. And then I want to open up the questions with the group. Um, you know, we, I tell my students that, you know, they can read or they can watch or they can listen to the lecture, but if they get out their pencil and pen, they actually write, take those notes, something different happens. Something they activate a different part of their mind. And they act through the actual motion motion of it. And they get more out of it. What I'm wondering is you spent a lifetime, countless hours, with food ways and embroidery and crochet and beadwork and everything else. What's going on? Is there a, a distinct I see all these kids with their darn devices. You know, that, that I have too. But still, is there something going on? So are they getting something out of are those in mind working in a different way when they're beating? I think so. Their motor skills are better. I mean, it, it enhances their motor skills. You know, and they have they have to think, okay, I'm putting this bead work, this beading here or this crochet, but what do I want it to become when it's complete? You know, how do I want my stitches to 
look when it's complete. That's beyond motor skills. That, that's, that's aesthetics. Yes. yes. That's, that's, that's inviting the creative. But combining it with the actual physical. My grand, I can't, I, I didn't ask because I had enough respect not to ask. I don't think that my grandmother and my grandfather could read or write. So, she never left a recipe. She never left instructions. So I had to learn about participant observation. If I didn't participate in the activity and observe real close, it don't matter if I, had, I went out and I read it somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's that actual doing yeah. and watching the those. But she did She never left. Like I said, she never left recipes. My mama never left recipes, but it's because she didn't have time to write them down. Is what she would tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Just to watch, to learn. That was their words: watch and learn and do it. Well, that was so, much a cultural thing to do. Mm -hmm. So you know. By doing it and observing what they were doing, you learn. So this is okay, but to actually, I mean, and they may get some satisfaction out of having some games on there that they can actually do. Make one of these on their phones or on their computers, but it's not as you know satisfying as doing it with a needle and the thread. Being with somebody that's talking to you and teaching you. Those connections are real. Do we have some questions? So, what does that mean? Parching, parching vegetables? Oh, you burn, you toast them. My grandma had a little thing, she would hold hers over fire sometimes. If she wanted to do one pepper, she would just, she says, just burn it, babe. It tastes better, just burn it. Now, her tomatoes, she had to come all flat iron or flat thing, she would actually put in her little wood burning stove on the ash and she would like parch her peppers and parch her tomatoes and garlic, onions, everything. You know, now, I, I'm still with people. How does that make it better? It tastes better. It depends on what your taste buds want. Yeah. Like I've started doing a lot of parching peppers and stuff and it triggered things or the, oh, you know, I remember this recipe. Okay, I made some chicken and rice. Was it yesterday or day before? And I parched the garlic on the fire. I took my palms, put my garlic hose there in Burton. Did the peppers, chopped them all up, and you, you, put, you know, I put my chicken in there and I let it brown. And then the oil put that little chicken skin, and I put the garlic on those parched peppers and other herbs in there and then it puts the flavor in the oil and you get the whole flavor into the rice and everything you didn't just add in pepper and salt so it, it enhances it the, enhances the it's taste it's a deeper with more depth of the taste is that right mm -hmm. it's, it's a caramelization it's, it's, it's the sugar that's in the, in the garlic in the garlic and the onions it caramelizes just like you know and it makes it get a sweeter sweeter taste and the peppers are like a crushed red pepper that you buy in the store, so it's the same thing. It's just whole. I have thrown away the food on this as Yes. <laughs> Don't throw your tomatoes away. When they start getting real ripe, you slice the little buddies up and put a little brown sugar on them, a little salt, stick them in the oven, let them finish drying, and eat them with sandwiches. Peppers, they dry up on your counter because you think, oh, they're real thin, they're no good. Put them on the fire and the them. Chop them up real fine and put it in your meats. Garlic, same way. You know, parch it, put it in your meats or in your vegetables and stuff. It, it gives it a whole different flavor. It's just like going down here to King River Kitchen and you see those oils that are up and it's got all those herbs and stuff in it. It's the same. Probably a lot of those have been really dried or parched and put in there. It enhances the oil. So, like, like I was saying, you know, people were doing this hundreds of years ago, and they just continue to do it. And I'm just lucky that I learned. My grandmother.
was married her first husband when she was 13. And so, and then my grandma Susie Sepulveda, I think she was like 15. So they were getting married young. And they learned all this stuff. She was born in 1896, her and my uncle. And my, aunt, my grandma Susie, I think, was born in 1903. But Mama's mom was real old. She lived to be over 100. Because I was about three or four, and I can remember that my grandma, Long Warrior, I, I got pictures of me, you know, I was just a little girl. Mom and Dad and Grandma Long Warrior standing with them. But she was born probably in the 18, late 1870s. So, and I mean, it was a storytelling. And as I said, a lot of them didn't know how to read and write, so they would teach by talking to each other and doing with each other. And so, you know, all the stories would just be passed down. We got an example of that today. Yeah. Folks. I, I kind of ha I, I had a little disconnect in um, the the in, in, so I'm reading I haven't heard you guys say this but I'm reading here that um, uh, Miss Rhonda is Choctaw Apache tribe of Ebar mm -hmm. and the tribe and so was that. I'm a member of the Choctaw Apache tribe. Okay, so these are Choctaw Apache her heritage. All the way back to the 18th century. From the 18th century. We were we were part of those people that they call the Adesanyo. Historians call the Adesanyo. The Adesanyo were people who were lived at Spanish Fort at Los Adais. So uh, I have seventh generation grandparents that were there. I had grandparents that were Indian, the Carmonas. When they closed Los Adais, they sent they, everybody, a lot of them went back to Texas, to San Antonio. And the Indian people, they put them at uh, Mission Bolero. Mission Bolero is what eventually became the Alamo. So in 1790s, when they started secularizing the missions or closing the missions, a lot of those Indians those families, they started coming back to the East just because some of them were born in Los Angeles and like uh, they settled around Zawali, which the Spanish called it Bayasi. It was uh, yeah, Bayasio. Bayasio means little valley and Bayasio eventually became Zawali. The name was changed to Zawali. Okay. So all and you grew up on the bank of Bayasio. I did. It actually grew up on the bank of Bayasio. So they put a mission there in 1792, San Miguel de Guadalupe, and Zawali, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. So is that where the Camino de Real, does that play yeah. that connection yes. there? Yes, El, 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 El Camino Real goes oh, right through that, that area. Okay. You know, between that area and up toward DeSoto Parish in there, that would all be portions of the El Camino. And so your family, and then you all have French names, so then this was also... I married a French man. <laughs> <laughs> I just tried to make these connections. I married a French man. So no. these are French, yes, and in the Indian. Yes, and see, in the uh, 19th century, well, actually, when the Spanish still had that area, they started bringing in all these people to settle because they did not have the military force to control their area that they claimed. Uh, they brought in settlers and they even brought Choctaw Indians in, settled them on the Spain River, I mean, and those Apacherias that were at Los Adais, they were settled over there. And all of them, you know, many of them married in Spanish, some French. My my grand my I have a grandfather his name was uh, William Bibi, which it was William Babe, you want to call it French, and um, he was settled in Bayou but he came from here in Anchorage by way of Point Pompeo. So I mean you had all this mixed people 
coming in there. And eventually, you know, they married into all those folks. Um, that's why, you know, we married, we married Chaka, you know, and there are Apache over there. And probably some of die mixed in over there. But, uh, so, that's how we came to live. Who are you teaching now? Who am I teaching now? Besides the petition of the, the, you know, the Rising Sun Institute. That's it. Do you have any folks that are teaching these things too? Uh, Aaron. <laughs> Whoever wants to listen. Whoever wants to listen. I like to talk. You know, the tribal council, Jake. Jake's related to me. Mary's related to me. Lorraine's related to me from over the Wally at Eagle Way. And if they have questions, I got one more. Okay. Pete told me that you made string rosaries. Oh, I haven't made any in years, but I can. Well, well tell me about that. Well, I mean, you know, you know, they had the beaded rosaries, and then when they didn't have the resources to make the beaded right. rosaries, the ladies started going using cord, cordage to make their rosaries. And, um, you know, the men would carve little crosses. That's why we made some tamales. And we ate tamales 
my grandfather used to eat tamales with cane syrup on them. Oh, really? Yeah, he said it was like his busy his meat his syrup. <laughs> <laughs> and how much was a dozen? Oh, back in the day, whatever they wanted to give her. Because like I said, you know, she wouldn't care if they come put 50 cents down. She had all these tamales, and she was just going to give the money to the priest anyway. So, it didn't matter. By the way, about $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10. $10, $10.
all of these uh, real nice black people, they remember they were my mom's maids or their parents, and that's the way I was raised, totally different from Rhonda, and it was only three miles apart. And it, you know, it's amazing. I was raised, I told somebody at one time, I was raised during segregation, but I was also segregated from the black people in my town because I was Native American and they didn't allow me to play with anybody in my neighborhood. And my mom dressed well, my dad dressed well, they were supervisors and all that had money, hired people. And as a matter of fact, this 2020 was the first time I ever mowed grass. <laughs> And now I bought me a ride in my mower. It was always hard. My daddy had long people. My mother had people that did her gardens. I never saw a garden raised until my daddy retired at 67 years old. And he put a garden in his backyard as his play. He would give all the vegetables to the neighbor. I never went to the, I never even picked a piece of crap. Funny example, my other cousin, there's right there in his wallet, Alvin. Mm -hmm. He was always raising, and his, right out there, they were slaughtered animals and stuff like that. So one day he told me, uh, back in 2008, Lorraine, come on, get some greens and everything before you go back to the river. That time I was reading. And so you go over and pick the mustard, and over here I'll pick you the turnips. Well, I just started pulling the mustard up out of there. Hell, girl, he said, you're supposed to just twist the tops off and leave the roots on the back of I said, Alvin, I have never ever gotten one pick in the office with the pork chips. They're picked up. So, I mean, that's, that's how much a Native American in a certain culture and how you, it's just, and I enjoy coming to Rhonda and listen because she says her grandmother, her grandmother, her grandmother, all of my grand, my, both of my grandmothers was dead before I was ever born. So I never got that experience. But I did have great days, and I think about Rhonda doing all this. I was a flunk out. One of my aunts said, culture young ladies, she was a Santos. She said, learn how to embroidery and crochet and all that. Well, I tried to learn embroidery. I tried to learn crochet. I was a flunk out. I didn't get to do it. <laughs> it was like at Mary's grandma. A few years back, I did this uh, document, sort of like an educational thing. My is Tomasa. It's a little thing. Okay. I got Mary's grandmother on there and she said you know she said we've been sitting it's all down for us to dog tamales when they say dog tamales is you put the you put the dough on the shove and you use your thumbs to spread the dough well she said you know you were supposed to be able to hold the shove up and see through the dough she said I'd flunk out every time she said because I'm gonna be cooked dick they'd send me away from the table because <laughs> I was feeling her I thought <laughs> You just flunked yourself out. You didn't want to be dotted to my face. So it's wonderful that Bob has kept the yeah. traditions of that. You, you I'm just, I'm just so excited. You are your grandparents' ride. Huh? I meant to say that you are your grandparents' ride. Passing it on. More questions? Are you going to show us what you brought here? Sure. You can come up here, I'll show you. You can be more than welcome to come up. Like this right here, <laughs> it's a cover stitch. My grandma used to you know, like do her apron. Uh, my grand, this is the first uh, skill I ever had for my grandma. And then, you know, this and these little stitches here. And this is some sort of bag to harvest. Uh, it's, it's like, well. And thus the passing oh, continues. Yeah. <laughs> And so when you said you learned how to fringe, what, what, what's the material? Where do you get this fringe? Well, right now, you, know, you just order the supplies, like the fringe supplies. Like, the fringe is really not cutting. And so they're teaching you how to tie these knots to keep them nice and loose like this. Folks. Louisiana Tradition Fair, Rhonda Remedies.